to another episode of Control Alt Career, a podcast where we share stories of people who have taken a leap and embarked on an alternative career path in Asia. I'm your host, Jennifer Ong, and today I'm very happy to have my friend Joyce Chang join us here. Joyce is a licensed architect, a well-known calligrapher, artist, and the founder of Joyce Chang Design Studio in Hong Kong. After graduating from UCLA with an environmental science degree and UPenn with a master's in architecture, she returned to Hong Kong and started her career at an architecture firm. Along the way, she picked up calligraphy and three years later left her job to pursue calligraphy and her creative business full time. She has since expanded into jewelry, fine art, and has just launched Aspire, an online membership subscription where she teaches others how to establish and build her own creative business. Thanks, Joyce, for your time and for joining me here today. I'm so excited to be here. So first things first, um, tell us a little bit about how you were able to transition away from working at an architecture firm to starting your own calligraphy business. So you kind of touched on it earlier where I worked in an architecture firm and I picked up calligraphy while I was uh, doing that full time. So I was doing it on the side for about a year before I actually quit and took it full time. Um, and in, in the beginning, it was honestly, it wasn't meant to be a business. It was something that I uh, like kind of defaulted to um, because I was quite unfulfilled at my job creatively. Um, and I came across some Instagram videos of um, calligraphy and I thought it was very interesting. I've never done it before. And I did some research. It wasn't that hard to find the materials. It's very affordable. So I just started practicing every single day uh, for at least 20 minutes. And um, I just fell in love with it. And it was like the thing that I looked forward to doing every day when I got off work or when I was done studying for my architecture exams. Um, and I would do it no matter whether it's like 9 p.m., 2 a.m. Um, I just, it was something I really needed. Um, and yeah, and then once I started um, an Instagram account for it, and it was purely just for myself. I did make it public, but I just wanted to track my progress. Um, but I mean, because I was posting work consistently, I was able to gain some traction on the platform and just getting like 10 more likes like gave me even more, um, I guess, motivation to continue practicing and posting and started refining my style, the kind of images I wanna post. Um, and quite shortly after that, I would say about four months into when I first picked up the pen, I got my first job with it. And you know, then the momentum just kept building, but that was the very beginning of how it transitioned from a hobby into a side hustle. My first job was actually um, an on-site um, calligraphy service at an event for Joe Malone, which is um, like a, fragrance and uh, hand cream kind of brand from London. Um, so I don't know why I decided to do this, but it's a good idea. So I recommend you guys doing this if you do it. If you have a social profile, just drop in an email on your profile. So there's a way people can contact you. And that's all I did. I dropped in a new email address that's not my personal one. And um, within one week of me doing that, I got my first inquiry by some PR marketing manager within Joe Malone in Hong Kong um, and they reached out to me asking me if I was available to um, you know, be at their event this weekend um, in order to be kind of like an add value customization, personalization kind of service for their products. And I was blown away because I didn't know that people found my work to be up to par in order to, um, you know, uh, to, I guess, work with a brand like Joe Malone. But if they think I'm good enough, then I'm good enough. So that's what, that was my first job. And, you know, once I got that, then, you know, Christmas season came around. That's kind of like when the four or five month mark was at for me. And um, then I got other jobs with other brands doing pretty much the same thing. How do you think that they found you through Instagram? Did you already have like a pretty strong following at that point? Um, were there certain hashtags that you used where they were able to find you? Um, did you ever find out, I guess, like how they found out about you, your profile? Yeah, I mean, I think that in the beginning, you know, when, like, you know, when I wasn't that well known for this yet, um, I did have, I guess, enough work on my page to show them what I can write and kind of what my script looked like. Maybe it was on different surfaces um, of products and stuff like that. But um, I think uh, 
they found me through hashtags, I'm pretty sure. So I love using a range of hashtags and the geographically specific ones like Hong Kong calligraphy, calligraphy Hong Kong, you know, like Hong Kong artists, like that kind of stuff is, I do know that a lot of these, um, it is an avenue that a lot of PR um, and marketing people uh, try to discover new talents um, because they're always on the lookout for this. So I think even now um, where hashtag culture has changed um, in the last few years, it's still a pretty important avenue for you to be discovered for your specific type of art. And so I guess, did you know much about how to market your business on Instagram or was it purely just you kind of put your work out there and then it naturally evolved into? Um, no, I didn't know because I think I didn't spend much time thinking or uh, kind of researching about marketing tactics on Instagram or even trying to grow a bigger following because I think my back then my focus wasn't really to make money from it. Um, it was a really nice surprise. And once I did, then, you know, I spent more time on it. But I think the key thing was being consistent with content uh, publishing because like, you know, publishing your content um, is the only way your work is going to be seen. And it works really well with a algorithm like Instagram. Uh, where the more consistent you are, um, the algorithm likes that better. So your work will show up more and more upfront in the, yeah, in the feed. So at that point in time, you weren't really thinking about starting a side business. Like this was more just a hobby, something you did um, to kind of de-stress and keep sane. So once you got the first job, were you like, oh, actually, maybe I can like turn this into a business? Or was it still like, oh, like, let's just see where this goes? Um, I'm a pretty conservative person, so I, I don't think that that amount of success was enough for me to validate that I thought it was going to be a side business, but I loved making extra income um, for from something that I really loved, and I think that's the only thing that I could say that from, right, making money from a passion. Um, I think it's quite scary to be um, saying that I'm going to make this full-time uh, from a passion, so I think I left it, like, as a maybe I'll make some money and then maybe I'll turn it, turn it into a side business. But I would say it didn't take me, it took me probably a whole year after that before I even considered kind of like, oh, you know, I can actually make this a proper consistent side business. And then, you know, further along, maybe another year after that to have the confidence to say that, you know what, I think I can make it a full-time business. Um, and it really took more jobs, more inquiries, and you know, not just jobs like the one I described where I'm working with a corporation for an event, but really like establishing my style more, um, start brainstorming ideas of other ways I could make money with this one creative skill. So it could be making my own products, it could be teaching workshops, like there's a range of things and really kind of like dipping my toes into many different things and seeing what works for me, what do I enjoy, what is my audience like, um, kind of like as I kept doing that and just making things happen, making progress one step at a time, um, helped me gain confidence to slowly transition to, this is a hobby, then this is something I could make some money to being a side business to then being a full-time business. Mm -hmm. I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. So along the ways from, you know, this was a hobby to quitting your job, were there certain metrics you were looking at? Like, oh, this had to bring in X number of dollars or, oh, I needed to be able to consistently get two jobs a month. Were there certain things you looked at where you felt, okay, now that I have this, I feel ready to leave my job now? Um. So actually, my story is that I didn't actually quit my job for the purpose of starting a full-time business. I did quit my job without another job lined up um, because I was very, very burnt out from taking the seven professional exams I needed to take for architecture. And um, I decided that I needed a three-month break for myself. And once I went on a break, then obviously I had so much more time. I was actually initially going to explore going to interior design or other kinds of architecture jobs and still run calligraphy as a side business. Um, but then, you know, as I had more time to meet other creatives um, in Hong Kong, uh, you know, try out new projects, uh, do more collaborations, it organically turned into something that I was doing full time. Like I was packed, you know, my schedule was packed and I realized that it, it really could be something that um, I could dedicate all my time to. And um, in terms of metrics, I think that 
I felt okay doing that because yes, I was making a bit of consistent income from it. Did it match my architecture job salary? Absolutely not. But I think I was able to continue um, believing that I could turn it full time and make it work financially in the near future because there was so much potential. Like I knew that there was a lot of projects I could try and I'm not good enough to make, you know, a lot of income from it yet, but I could see it. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that belief kind of validated my, my idea of that, you know, I can be like, can p- pursue an alternative career as a creative entrepreneur. Um, and it, it honestly got easier every month, um, kind of doing it and, you know, being in the, like, in the moment, kind of like just doing completely just creative work for myself uh, to believe that it's possible. I think in the beginning, I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I still do, I think, um, but it does get easier over time. How did you learn to build a creative business? What were some of the resources that you used? So I guess once you have the idea, right, we never really know how to execute it. And what I found really helpful was um, to listen to podcasts um, of like other people who build online, it doesn't have to be creative, but just online businesses. Um, and a lot of these podcasts are free. Um, <clears throat> and just kind of like, also like this kind of podcast where, you know, you get inspiration um, from listening to other people's stories and um, you just get kind of like, you learn about a wider network through uh, free resources like these. Um, on top of that, I started investing in, Um, Well, through these podcasts and through kind of blogs and just doing Google research, you will find some classes that, you know, you could take specifically related to what you're trying to build. So for me, an example would be I was interested to go into weddings as a calligrapher to make stationary invitation suites. And I found um, a very like an expert in this field doing exactly what I want to do and exactly where I want to be in two, three years. And she offered free resources. You know, she offered a lot of like, um, like also paid classes um, of all kinds. And I would then invest maybe a range from like maybe 200 US dollars to 500 US dollars in order to take like kind of like a deep dive class to learn everything as fast as I can. And of course you could learn and trial and error all these things on your own. Um, That's absolutely doable. But I think at that point, given that I was a bit, I felt a bit uneasy, you know, um, just, you know, I wanted to make income and wanted to make this grow faster so that I can validate quitting an architecture job for, you know, an alternative career like this. I want to grow fast. And the fastest way to grow is to pay for your education. Um, But in order to know what classes to look for or what resources to dive into, whether they're free or paid, is to have clarity about what you want to build in your business. Um, which is why I said that, you know, like in the beginning, maybe it's good to flush it out of your system to try as much as you can. Um, And, you know, obviously don't do that for a whole year, but do it for, you know, one to three months, maybe. Um, And that was helpful. And you could also do that while, you know, I could have also done that while I was doing my architecture job. Um, It's absolutely something you could invest maybe five hours a week into um, doing and uh, you'll get a lot more clarity doing that. And in terms of like, I think just now you're mentioning, how did I start meeting local creatives? Um, I don't just meet calligraphers. So like a creative entrepreneur could be all kinds of, um, I guess, creative. So in, including photographers, um, you know, illustrators, painters, calligraphers, um, stylists, like there's so many bakers. Um, and although our creative skill is different and probably some business is different to others, but, you know, kind of like what we all go through in the beginning journey is very similar. So I connected with these people on Instagram. Um, I DM them, you know, like you just kind of have to have a thicker skin and just like reach out to these people, make some conversations and then turn that into something that you could meet up for a coffee, right? Get to know these people face to face and some would resonate with you more than others. Some other people's journey would be more relevant to yours as well. So once I started doing that, I made some creative friends and I only built those friendships stronger and stronger over the years. Um, And I was able to learn a lot from their experience, whether they're in the first month of building their business or, you know, year five. Um, And having that kind of conversation with someone who is like like-minded person, you know, is, is like not talking to my mom about this because she is not like super in tune into what I'm interested in right now. 
So having people who just gets what I'm talking about is extremely helpful, not only for me to gain knowledge, but just to have a support system um, as well. Um, and of course, having them local geographically is even better because um, they work in your market, the same market that you're trying to break into at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and o- obviously over time now, it's been four or five years since I first started doing this full time. I've been able to expand that into global people. So I, I do have a lot of kind of creative soulmates that live in the US, live in Australia. Um, but I would say always start locally. Um, speaking of your mom, what did your parents say when you told them that you were going to quit your architecture job? Um, and pursue calligraphy full time? Um, I think that honestly was one of my biggest struggles was um, my parents and my family. Um, like we have a very, very close relationship and my mom is kind of like my role model. But I think doing this transition into an alternative career where both my parents didn't really understand what that even means or that there is such a demand for it or that there is potential to not grow a small, like you could grow a small business into a creative empire. So, you know, um, their skepticism to it, I think was pretty hard um, on me because it truly resonated with my own inner fears. Um, Like, you know, they just were, they just had the ability to say it out loud, um, saying what I'm thinking inside. Um, And especially coming from kind of like a long professional route from going to architecture school for like seven years and then working for three years, um, then getting a license. And then now I come up to them and say, just kidding, I'm going to stop that and, you know, put that on the side to them. It's like it's not really a linear trajectory into how you could possibly start uh, building an online business on a platform like Instagram. Um, so I think it, I would say it took my parents, um, you know, a couple of years to slowly kind of start understanding what I do. And I think what I found most helpful was just to be very transparent, um, with your communication. I think it's easy. And I did this in the beginning, let's say the first six months, I just shut them down. So whenever they ask me a question about, it could be what I'm working on, or it could be like understanding my business more because I felt uncomfortable talking about it knowing that they were skeptical. Um, I just kind of avoided the questions. You know, I wanted to shut the conversation down as soon as possible. And by not letting them in to my world and not letting and not educating them more of what exactly I'm doing, it's very hard for them, for me to expect them to be on board. Um, because like they don't necessarily use all these online platforms. Like they don't grow up in the kind of generation where we do, where like the world is so connected and there's so many more opportunities online nowadays. Um, so they don't get it. It's like they get the traditional, you know, kind of hierarchical corporate climbing. Um, so, and I was also scared because in a way, like I wasn't sure if I could make it. I was still testing everything. So I think the most key thing is just letting them in and um, like start talking about what I'm working on, uh, what is not working, what is working, um, you know, how much money I'm making, um, what are my goals in the next, let's say, half a year and then maybe a year. And once I started opening that conversation, then, you know, even traditional parents like my parents were able to kind of op- become more open minded to what I do. And eventually now they really do believe in what I do. So it is possible to get through that hurdle, but it, it was hard. Um, and it's probably the hardest thing that I've felt like kind of deciding to um, pursue my own business um, was that kind of resistance um, from the closest people in my life. And I guess for people listening who maybe come from a similar background and is thinking about pursuing something similar, what sort of advice do you have for them um, when dealing with you no know, societal or parental pressure, what? how do you keep yourself going and not revert back to, oh yeah, actually you're right, you're right, like this isn't working out, like I'll just go back to getting a full-time job somewhere. Do you have any advice for people who are facing similar issues? Yeah, I mean, I think the struggle with an alternative career is it's not as uh, simple and like kind of the 
like it's not as common sense for people to know what your job title means. And actually, a lot of times you might find that you have trouble identifying what your job title is. Like, you know, do I call myself a calligrapher, an artist, you know, like, or do I just call myself a freelancer? You know, I think it could really change. Um, and it, it, your title could change depending on who you talk to, you know. But I think the most important thing is to identify first when you come out, it's kind of like your close circle, your inner circle. Who are the ones who will be your like cheerleaders and your supporters? And like with my own example, in the very beginning, it was not my parents, right? But it was my brother. Um, it was Jennifer here, like my really good friend, you know, like it was, it, and, and, you know, having an, like not everyone in your inner circle will be your biggest cheerleader. I think that part you just need to recognize and accept, but, you know, being able to identify who are the ones who are your biggest supporter, those will be the people that you start sharing your exciting ideas about that you feel comfortable talking to them about what you're doing. And that's really all you need in the beginning. And then the next step when you want to expand beyond your inner circle is to start tapping into creative communities. Like I was mentioning earlier, either it's local or there are online friends that you've made on um, a platform like social media. Um, you could tap into Facebook groups that are free where literally it is made for you. So there are Facebook group called, you know, like, um, uh, wedding calligraphy business. Like it has to be a bunch of calligraphers then. So, uh, these are extra resources that you can, you can tap into that is now beyond your inner circle. Um, and the reason I'm asking, you know, I did that and I'm asking you to do that is because you will find, again, like-minded individuals who just get exactly what you want to do and what you are doing. Um, and like kind of once you have more, all these kind of positive influence and supporter, you will feel so much more validated to continue pursuing your dream and not quit. And, you know, we all get imposter syndrome all the time, like meaning that you don't think you're good enough or that you don't know if you can do this and all these kind of like thoughts that you have. Um, everyone has that, you're not alone. And by having these people, you'll realize that everybody has it and like everybody goes through it. So um, yeah. And then of course, as you continue expanding, once you get results from kind of your creative work in the world, uh, again, that's another form of validation. So, yeah. Okay. So, circling back to um, when you ultimately decided to leave your job, I guess when you left your job, you were thinking you needed some time off because you were feeling very burnt out from your architecture job, as well as taking all the exams for your license. Um, were you thinking at that point when you quit your job about finding another corporate job? Um, no, <laughs> I think that I was so excited about where I could build my business. Um, and that's because I spent a lot of time working internally where I wasn't that focused on making money the first week, but rather spend the first two months mapping out, um, what are the different avenues I could do in order to make money from a creative skill like that? You know, it's really about researching what's out there in the world already. Um, let's say, I identified weddings, you know, as something I could identify, you know, sourcing products like stones or uh, making cake toppers. Like those are all kind of products I could make from my calligraphy skill. And because I had all these kind of mapped out and all these projects I was going to try in April, May, June, you know, I had so much on my plate that I wasn't thinking about finding um, another job. Um, it was actually something my parents wanted me to do because, um, that was kind of like what they thought was the best path for me. And I persisted in not doing that, but I did give myself uh, checkpoints, which I think is important, is that I had all these projects mapped up, right? Okay, I wanted to do this by June, but, and you know, if I hadn't hit that um, kind of like milestone that I thought was a realistic one, then I would question, why is it, you know, is it because I, didn't I, I kind of lost focus or you know like I just don't think that you know I would just basically use these checkpoints to evaluate whether I'm moving moving forward healthily and you know I always had it in the back of my mind that if I miss a couple of these milestones then I need to think about going back into a corporate job because I wanted to be responsible for my own financials you know it needs to be sustainable in the long term and I think fortunately because I was quite um, focus in terms of how I wanted to grow. I never really reached that point where I needed to consider seriously if I needed to find another job. Um, but I did have that safety net, which is why I took the license. Um, 
for, my, for architecture because it would allow me to enter back into the market easily if I ever chose to. Um, but it, all in all, I think in the last five years, I haven't really had a moment where I knew I was going to look for even a part-time job. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, in terms of marketing your brand and getting your name out there, I know you started off with um, Instagram and people slowly discovered you through Instagram. Are there other things that you did to market yourself and get more jobs, especially now that you were much more reliant on these jobs for, for your income? Um, yeah, I think that other than social media, where you show up all day, every day, and do as much as you can to use a platform like that, I just use word of mouth. So I think I got more confident over the years to talk about my work, you know, what I do, et cetera. And, um, you know, whether it's to my really close friend who would then tell their friend, or if it's to um, meeting other calligraphers who then sometimes would share job inquiries together, um, et cetera. And I think doing more collaborations with other kinds of creatives or brands, um, meaning it could be more boutique brands where you could reach out to them and propose a collaboration where you might not get paid in the beginning, um, but it's just to get in front of their audience. So widening your network um, through your own outreach and making personal connections, whether it's with a brand or with a person. Um, and I think as much as you can talk about it, talk about it, right? And the more you talk about it, the more confident you feel about what is it you're doing. The more you talk about it, the more clarity you will get about what is it you're doing. Um, and so two ways, right? One is just, you know, by content publishing on a free platform like Instagram. And second, it's just by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, once you start getting a few clients who, whether buy from you as a, like a, a product or doing a service for another brand, um, they will start spreading that awareness um, when other people are looking for similar things. So if I made a cake topper for your birthday today, you know, somebody saw it and thought it was really pretty, you might find another, you know, there would be another distant friend who reached out to you asking, hey, you know, that cake topper from that birthday, can I make one too? It's literally that simple. Got it. Um and do you feel like your Instagram, because you had such a distinctive style, was what really helped you market yourself and propel you forward? Um, <clears throat> the answer is definitely yes, um, but my style took time to build. So um, if you go into my Instagram, um, Joyce Chang underscore, you will see that in the beginning, it was nothing like it is today. And that's because I had to get clarity in my creative style and kind of like, really dig deep into my roots to know what is me and what is not someone else. So like in the beginning, a lot of times, even though if I'm posting a lot of pretty pictures, it was an imitation of what I liked looking at on other people's platforms. And I did it for myself. So my work was quite dreamy. It was quite feminine and kind of like vintage actually, which is quite different from my brand now. It's very modern. It's very classy, um, minimal, um, which actually refers back to my lifestyle choices and, and also kind of my architecture work. Um, so, but then having this style that I have now, which I think I pivoted two years into my brand, and now it's been another three years with this specific style, um, having a strong brand personality and a strong brand presence where people can cover my name and just look at my work and just know that this is from me, um, it allowed me to diversify and expand my business beyond calligraphy. So in the beginning, you mentioned that I do calligraphy, but I also do fine art. So ink and resin work. I do a lot of illustrations. You can um, like floral illustrations, watercolors. Um, I also have my own line of calligraphy jewelry. I mean, that's spanning quite a different few sectors um, and industry. And I was able to seamlessly transition between them because in the end, it, it looks like my work. It was my aesthetic and it was my brand that tied it all together. So it was never really that big of a shocker to my audience when I was pushing out new offerings. And what made you decide to expand your services beyond just calligraphy? Like what was it about jewelry and fine art and even actually now your online course uh, that attracted you to explore those avenues? Um, so I think it's two things. Um, I, I identify myself as a creative who do not like to be boxed in by one creative skill. So um, I just believe calligraphy is not really um, 
it's, it's a type of art instead of like an industry. So I see artists as an industry. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean that as a calligrapher, I can't pair my calligraphy with floral illustrations, right? It, it doesn't mean that I can't put my calligraphy onto a, a range of other, other things. It could be in a jewelry like I did, right? So um, I didn't want to limit my creativity and I get bored when I do the same thing over and over again. And so um, kind of having that, at the back of my mind and having the confidence to continue expanding, um, I think brought about my diversity in my business now. Um, and then second thing is I think, let's say online education or, um, you know, like tapping into making jewelry, which is a kind of active passive income because the work is done upfront once where I design jewelry once and it can be mass produced at the back end, depending on the demand. Um, those two I pursued because I was growing and I was expanding my business. So this is from a monetary perspective. Like I wanted to um, kind of free up my time. I don't want to keep trading time for money every day. So there's only as many place cards as I can write a day because, and then if I travel, I would never be able to make any money in those two weeks because I cannot do the kind of active income, which is a lot of what just calligraphy services. So I was thinking about new ideas um, and new, like kind of new sectors in my business where I could still do the creative work, but do the work upfront and still reap benefits from it afterwards. Um, so that's how I came about doing the jewelry line. And then the online education is another, um, where it's very new in my business right now. And I had an strong desire to do this one was what i was mentioning just now is to build some sort of passive recurring income into my business from what i already know from my experience right and the second is that as i have been doing this for about five years now my purpose of doing this has also shifted in the beginning it was for myself it was for my time flexibility for my creative fulfillment but you know because i've been in this for a while and i have talked to many different kind of creatives and I see people like me three, four years ago, um, and I really want to be able to offer my insight and my expertise to them so that they can grow um, as fast as they can. And also I want to encourage more kind of young creatives or budding creatives to be able to have the confidence to go pursue an alternative creative career. Um, so that's why I kind of introduced this new arm because I had a new vision and a new purpose in my business was to make impact on budding creatives, um, yeah. Thanks. Um, shifting gears a little bit, just to talk about the business side of your creative business. I'm curious to know, how did you figure out how to make money from this? And was it difficult transitioning from getting a regular salary, you know, every month you get paid, to a more irregular type of income? Hmm. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, how did I start like knowing how to make money from it? I think, you know, in the beginning when you're not so confident about your work or even now when I push on anything that's new, it's hard to price your work, right? Because you just don't know how much, you don't necessarily value your own work the most, um, which is the part that I, I want to tell everyone that you have to value work. If you don't value your own work, nobody will value your work. So it's a, it's a range between doing your market research and just following your intuition. So are you going to feel good making just, you know, 50 US dollars um, uh, a month, uh, not, not a month, like an hour? Or do you feel better if you're making 100 US dollars an hour? If you feel better making 100 US dollars an hour, then that's your goal. And what can you do in order to make that, right? So can you, can you write 20 place cards and make 100 US dollars an hour? Maybe, you know, but maybe not as a beginner. So then maybe if that is your goal, then you should be offering something else. Um, but kind of follow your intuition for pricing and also don't doubt yourself um, in terms of like what you think you're worth. Com you know, complement that with a bit of market research um, to kind of get to know like where the market's at, I think is, is a good idea. Um, that's kind of how I started. Um, I initially, my biggest, uh, and I think a lot of people struggle with this in the beginning, your first clients are usually some sort of family, friend, or a friend of friend. And a lot of times, a lot of people might think that's not a real client because I kind of know them. I want to say that that's not true. And a client is a client, you know, like you always do start with your friends and family because that's your inner circle. Those are the people who know what you're doing. You know, those are only people you're letting in to know what you're doing. So, you know, maybe the first one 
The second one where you're learning how to do that specific product, okay, you don't have to charge for it. But quickly after that, I would say, learn how to charge through your inner circle first. So when a friend of a friend comes for the third time, you know, do try to start pricing and learning through that. It's better than learning through a stranger, to be honest. You know, you get a bit more leeway. And starting to charge with your closest people are act is actually sometimes quite hard because the closer they are to you, the more you feel like you should do it for free. And um, I don't really think that is something you should be doing long term. And when I lo mean long term, anything beyond a month, you should not do that anymore. And once you start charging once or twice, then you will... Uh, you will figure out your method and you figure out, you know, your method of pricing, your method of communication, and, um, and it will quickly transition into um, your first stranger client. I think when it comes to money, I think you, you brought up a really good point, which is it feels awkward sometimes to ask your friends to pay this kind of money. How do you find the confidence to do that? And I guess also tying back into um, what you mentioned earlier around imposter syndrome. Um, how do you handle and deal with imposter syndrome and find confidence and say, my work is truly valued at this. Um, I'm not really willing to give a discount because you're my friend. Um, you know, this is what I'm worth and this is what my, my art is worth. Um, I think no matter what stage at your business, you will always find some people who don't value your work or they're in, I guess in a way, they are not your clients. Like not the, the thing about running your own business, especially when you're running a creative business, is that you have to realize early on that your business and your work is not everyone's cup of tea. So it's the same thing I mentioned earlier when you know you first start out and you want to find your first supporters. Not everyone in your inner circle is that interested in your your creative like path. You know, maybe they're just not a creative person, or maybe that's just something they don't put that much time into. And that's okay. So it's the same thing with your audience. It's like, you know that there are just some clients who would come for you, come to you and, you know, ask you to do things for free, you know, for a discount, whether they're friends or a stranger, like just know that that's not because your work is not good enough. It's because they are not your clients. Speaking to everyone is equals to speaking to no one. So actually, the more specific you get uh, in terms of your price point, the type of work you do, the type of people you attract, um, you will and have to repel some people and attract and strongly attract the other ones that really resonate with you. And by doing that, that's when you really can charge the, your work and what you think it's worth. And those clients most likely will never really give you much resistance because they value your work and they see the value in your work as much as you do yourself. So it could be that they just, they, you know, like it, it could be you would get rid of those clients who will come to you and ask you, hey, you know, I saw this on someone others, some other person's website and profile. Can you recreate it for me, but at half the price? Um, you know, uh, being able to say no is actually one of the hardest things because, you know, especially in the beginning, you want to get as much experience and as much job, as much income as possible. Um, but being selective with your clients and what kind of work they ask you to do um, is a very, very important process and it helps protect your creativity. It helps protect the growth of your business um, because you're not like tied up doing all this kind of work that you don't feel validated in terms of pricing to do. And also you don't like doing that kind of work. Um, so shifting gears a little bit to something a bit more personal. Um, I wanted to ask you, because we often hear, you know, in the Western world, for example, people say, you know, follow your dreams money will eventually come. What do you think of this statement? Uh, I know in Asia, there's a very different view where it's much more about financial stability and you know what company you work for. Um, how do you, I guess, balance the two given that you know, you've spent a good number of years abroad and you're also from Hong Kong and come from um, a traditional Chinese family how do you balance this two, like the financial stability and the passion? Mm, um, I think it's casting your vision and, you know, kind of being very real. Like it's, it's kind of dreaming, like, you know, like that statement you were saying, you do need to cast your dream and your vision. But I think, you know, like you were saying, coming from a traditional, pretty practical society, I think always having a, uh, a sense of practicality and measuring stick um, to your dreams is what 
uh, I, I always do in order to kind of evaluate whether my dreams are real or is very fluffy. Um, so, you know, kind of going back to the checkpoints and the milestones that I set for myself, you know, make them realistic, but also uh, make them attainable and, you know, make sure that you stay on track to attain them. And if you don't, it's probably because it's too fluffy, it's too big, um, or it's unrealistic. So, you know, um, again, another thing is I don't, I really, really encourage budding creatives to not skip the foundational step. And the foundational stuff, a lot of the times are not monetary, like they don't bring you income. And a lot of time you're putting a lot of time into figuring out, you know, what does your brand stand for? What is your brand aesthetic? You know, your colors, you know, like what is the feel, the mood, you know, all of that. Like, why are you doing this? Like very kind of like you would think they're pretty basic questions. A lot of times you might even think that they're very personal questions because it makes you dig deep and ask, what is the meaning of all of this? You know, why am I doing this? Um, but really getting very much clarity about that would help you um, kind of grow with the purpose um, and will keep you on track when you're setting these milestones for yourself. And by doing that, your dreams become real dreams because you're taking small, actionable steps towards that dream every day, every month. And if you don't make progress and you don't take action, like actual action, like not just talking about it then um, then very quickly your dream will be un unattainable and you will find a lot of doubts and you'll probably quit before you can actually uh, attain the dream. Um, so yeah, don't skip the foundations. <laughs> totally hear you. And I think that that's one of the things that made you so successful in what you're doing right now. Um, so one last question for you before we close off. Do you have any advice for people who are thinking about pursuing this path as a creative entrepreneur? And what do you think, or what did you wish you knew before you embarked on this journey? Hmm. Um, so something I really want you to take home is that not all artists are starving artists and you do not need to be a starving artist. And I really believe that even if it's a very niche and small industry like calligraphy, like the, the, the kind of potential you can grow into is ginormous. It really, really is. And in the beginning, it's hard to see how wide you can cast your net. Um, but that's kind of actually the exciting part of growing your own business is that you can really choose how you want to grow it. So, you know, like that goes back to saying you don't want to be a starving artist means that you need to start charging for your work right from the get go, even if it's $5, like you have to charge for your work and um, gain that confidence as you do that. Um, another thing is that as a creative and using an online business model is to always be very consistent in publishing your content, you know, like um, kind of showing up for your audience that chose to follow you, even if it's 20, 200, 2000, like those are the people who decided to, you know, be on the path with you and you have to do your end by publishing content for them. Um, and, you know, don't worry about like you know, getting another 2000 followers because, Followers does not equal the amount of money in your bank, but 2,000 loyal followers is way better than 10,000 people who would never buy from you. So um, really show up serving them. It's about them much more than you. Yes, you're putting out your creative work, but you're putting out your creative work for these people who eventually would uh, kind of invest back into your business. So just remember that you're there for them and less about you. Um, and I think the last thing is that um, because when we're a creative entrepreneur, honestly, on any kind of like entrepreneur in the beginning, you are a solo entrepreneur, right? You have no staff, um, you know, nobody really, you, could, you don't have the financials to be able to outsource. So you do everything, like from the packaging to the creation to, you know, writing the captions to like everything. You wear so many, so many hats and it's easy to burn out. And I think it's really important to move forward creatively and in your business, but, you know, protect your mental health, you know, protect yourself, your time. So striking a good balance um, because you are the most important asset in your business. Without you, there is no business. So if you burn yourself out, if you don't take care of your mental state or your physical state, then there's no reason why you're doing this. Because honestly, once I take you out of the equation, there's nothing left. So just remember that you are the most important asset in your entire business. I think these are really, really great advice. And thank you so much, Joyce, for your time.
uh, here with us. Thank you for sharing all the insights and advice as well as your journey with us. Um, I think this has been immensely helpful. Um, and for our listeners, Joyce has also been very kind to offer a free guide on the five stages of building a creative a career. Um, so you can find this guide on her website, joycechang.co, um, and you can find out more about her work as well as the new online course that she has just launched. Um, otherwise, you can find this link as well on the show notes to this episode. Um, until next time, thank you, uh, thank you, Joyce, for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.